Uh, why don't we go ahead and 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 get started? Welcome to uh, the continuing BBISS um, lecture series. Um, we had our first two speakers, three speakers last semester, and we're continuing uh, uh, this semester. Um, the real intent of of this program is um, almost all of the speakers are internal to Georgia Tech or GTRI in this case. Um, and uh, uh, there are people that are working on sustainability across campus. And as we all know, sort of sustainability can encompass so many different facets and different topics. And um, uh, one of the things that we have trouble doing because it's such a large group of investigators um, working on such a large breadth of topics that we often don't know all the things that everybody else is working on. Um, so this was an opportunity um, to uh, share with each other and to learn from each other and 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 just um, you know the worst thing that happens is you go on this uh, uh, you go to a conference um, ten thousand miles away across an ocean or something and somebody says have you met Inga and you say no I don't know. I don't know who Inga is or something. And it turns out that she works not only at your university, she's probably in your building and maybe three doors down from your office. And you've seen her at the water fountain or the coffee shop or whatever, millions of times over, but you've just never made the made the connection in some way. And so this was an opportunity to try to uh, close that gap uh, amongst um, uh, so many of us. So uh, I think we have a couple more people that are going to drop in on us. Um, but today we have um, Elon Stern. Elon is uh, um, in the Georgia Tech Research Institute um, that you all know uh, is a separate but very vital part of Georgia Tech. Um, and Elon today is going to be talking about um, bringing solid state batteries to market, novel ma material fabrication and parametric life cycle models for a circular economy. Um, so, um, you know, Elon, we'll give the floor to you and I hope, uh, uh, I don't know how you'd like to uh, have if questions come up in the middle, if Please. you'd like to yeah, absolutely. engage and, yeah. and certainly afterwards uh, hang around and sort of get to know everybody. And, and uh, uh, that's what this is. This opportunity is really all about. So that turn it over to Elon. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Farrell, and everybody else for joining. Uh, so today I am going to discuss um, the, the the sort of research that we do um, in our unit is uh, very energy based, energy focused, specifically in this case. And uh, my my primary focus recently has been in uh, solid state batteries, um, but as you know, at GTRI, we are a bit more applied than some of the other academic units, although we collaborate quite a bit with them. So really, our goal is how do we translate that innovation towards um, integration into the market? So as we've seen in the news, uh, the growing EV sector has been uh, pretty much unprecedented uh, in the last handful of years, uh, really a hot spot here in the state of Georgia with um, between the EVs and the battery manufacturers from Rivian and Fryer to SK, uh, Ascend Elements, a recycling plant, there are just billions and billions of dollars uh, being pumped in um, primarily here in Georgia as a, as a, as a, leading, as a leading state in the uh, union here. But really what we're seeing is that with the need um, and the, the the kind of growth exploration, we really need to help understand both innovation, but then also uh, end of life and the recycling, uh, not just for the environmental impact, which is enormous, uh, but also just for the financials. And to make these costs competitive, we really need to understand how to reuse these materials. So for the plant, planned battery plant capacity, uh, as you can see here uh, in the dark green here in Georgia, um, there are, it's, it's, it's a leader and, um, it may be a little counterintuitive to some to think of, you know, the deep South here in Georgia as an environmental leader, uh, moving forward. However, um, it, it has been and will continue to be. So because of this, um, 
again, this is kind of the drive and the reason for the innovation need and uh, how to integrate that into you know, full supply chains. So where do, where do we fit in? GTRI, Georgia Tech. For us, um, with the automotive industry growing and really this transition towards the electrification uh, to meet these new global greenhouse emission uh, targets, we need to understand um, what this next generation of technology is going to look like. We need to help understand the improvements that are needed for charge rates and energy densities, because just those two alone right there are going to consume less electricity and less materials to reach the same goals. Um, at the same time, the power generation industry, uh, the um, you know whether it's in, in data centers or the utilities, uh, there's a big shift towards renewables and really kind of becoming uh, more mainstream at this point. And I think one of the primary bottlenecks at this point is still energy storage. Um, and that is going to be the last key to unlock for uh, full grid leveling. So mobile electronics, again, we want to be able to recharge these. We need longer lifetimes. And then as they become more and more ubiquitous, we need to understand a safer energy storage mechanism because of, um, we, we've all seen notes on and, and articles about uh, liquid electrolyte, liquid um, lithium polymer batteries, um, you know, fires in parking garages, on airplanes, wherever. So that's kind of where it sort of sets the table for this next evolution in energy storage, which is called solid state batteries. And as you can see here, schematically, uh, this is something that happens quite frequently with uh, liquid like liquid electrolyte batteries, you can get thermal runaway, which causes oxidation, and then you've got liquid combustion, fires, um, so on and so forth. Even if it doesn't get to that point, it, it, there is um, degradation, uh, performance degradation as well. These materials begin to outgas under temperature and pressure, and the performance um, suffers. So for us, innovation in a circular economy is critical because while we may be providing new uh, impactful solutions, those solutions you can be sure are going to be the problems of the next generation at some point. So we really need to understand the full life cycle and how this plugs into the kind of full environmental um, component here. So a lot of this modeling um, that was done here, which is a critical part of our work, led by Dr. Paul Gomez in the back, who fortuitously ended up uh, here today um, and really is a, a critical component for us to uh, help uh, drive the interplay between uh, performance at a uh, cell or battery level to kind of integrating into overall, um, you know, life cycle. So I'm going to go over a couple of slides about the solid state just to sort of give a little bit of background. I don't want to get too in the details or in the weeds if anyone has any questions about the chemistries or polymerizations or processes, please feel free. Otherwise, I'm going to just kind of scan through it a bit. This one, hey, however- Don, can, can I jump in and ask a um, non-technical question from the previous slide? So um, in, in defining the circular economy, um, you know, we, we talk about recycling versus reuse versus, um, you know, modularity, upgradability, uh, durability. Which dimensions of a circular economy are the most salient um, when we talk about these this yeah, new technology yeah. or solid state batteries? That, that, that's a great question. Um, and I, I don't have a full answer for that because that is a whole talk on itself, I would say. But for me, my focus is in the uh, material reuse. I think for us, as we're seeing um, sort of a shifting away from uh, some of these uh, sort of conflicts on materials, whether it be lithium or, um, you know, the, the transition earlier from iron, you know, now we're going um, to, to, you know, to nickel and cobalt. And for us to figure out ways that we can, we can maximize the reuse of that. And I think for me, I think the goal is um, the reusage, the repack repackaging and repurposing of those materials, both from an environmental aspect, but also from a supply chain and overall cost, uh, cost model. Thank you. So it would be um, 
recovery of these materials for use in this and other end uses. It that, doesn't. That's correct. It, absolutely. And it's not. Yeah, that, that's a great point you bring up because it's not just reuse in this uh, in these fields. A, a lot of the materials, whether it's just the stainless or the aluminum, um, will be reused into other fields. So we're working with companies like Ascend Elements that they take the they have these process and whether they're chemical or mechanical. Uh, how do we separate the material? And then they get reclassified into reusage for energy storage, reusage for consumer electronics, or reusage to go into things like um, balance of system for solar panels or just other um, additional structural uses. Thank you. So again, kind of coming back to why um, why solid state? So for us, if you look at kind of the three primary classifications, you've got liquid polymer, you've got ceramic, and then what we're proposing and what we're working on is a novel hybrid of ceramic and polymer. So if you look at the spider diagram here, you can see that the liquid electrolytes have high ionic conductivity and high interfacial contact. The ceramics have very low interfacial contact, but high thermal stability and electrochemical stability. So if you think about that, if you take a cup and you fill it up with M&Ms, the bottom of that cup has little holes, areas that they're not contact. And for, um, for ionic conductivity, it's that contact, it's the interfacial contact between those points, which is critical to how, uh, how these batteries perform. There, if you take you know, a glass of water and you pour in, you've got you know, full contact throughout. So how do we take now? The problem with the, with the liquid electrolytes is that it's got um, the dendrite suppression and thermal stability and electrochemical stability are very poor. Whereas for the ceramic, high electrochemical stability, de dendrite suppression, a dendrite is essentially a, an internal short. Uh, they, pr they produce these small micro cracks and it allows um, the uh, charge transfer between electrodes and shorts the, uh, shorts the material. So in this case, what we wanted to do is take a basically a hybrid and really try to work with the best of both worlds. So these solid composites, and what we're using is a, is a polymer, a ceramic, um, and it has much higher uh, interfacial contact and the dendrite suppression. So really the ionic conductivity and electrochemical stability are, are keys in the performance of this. So the results here, um, basically the, the, the few things that I will talk about here is that we've seen high ionic conductivity, which is about six X higher than some of the other solid state electrolytes, which was, which was nice. Um, the overall polymerization, the in-situ polymerization process um, is, as, as I mentioned, you can see here sort of the interfacial gaps between uh, these uh, lithium metals. And when you have this uh, solid ceramic, you could see where those gaps uh, would what, where the gaps would occur. So in this case now, it essentially fills in the gap, increasing the interfacial stability, which allows for high ionic conductivity and thus um, overall higher performance. So some of our benchmarks that we've seen, we've already exceeded. Um, we exceeded our year one targets after about month six of our, is it, this currently is a uh, three-year um, strategic initiative program at Georgia Tech in, 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 in GTRI. And um, we are in year one and a half right now. So the performance has been great. Um, the cycling test and stability. So basically what you can see here is in the over potential. And um, when you cycle through batteries, as you start to see this uh, diverging uh, uh, voltage, that means that it's no longer stable. And as that no longer is stable, then uh, the cyclability will be poor and um, the performance will suffer. So that was the LAGP, the, the, the black. If you look at the LAGP uh, hybrid, it remained stable uh, throughout over, um, I think these were, this was 50 hours, and I think it was two cycles per hour. So over 100 cycles already, we're seeing uh, large stability. Uh, similarly, we kind of transition from what's called a half cell test to a full cell, uh, and we see a high Coulombic efficiency of nearly 100%, which is essentially retention between uh, the cycles. Uh, similarly, the capacity um, is quite high as well after the 50 cycles. Um, and again, we talk about the polymerization. So now this is a bit of a transition for us because the kinetics between the polymerization are not really controllable. So it is a bottleneck when we get into large scale fabrication. And I think this is one of the methods that we deal with because uh, from an academic aspect, uh, you know, these are promising results. But when we look towards 
how do we integrate this into manufacturing dealing with um, kind of industrial scale, uh, we, we, we sense the, the limitations that we have here. So we had to make a bit of a pivot. Also, um, you want to move towards the um, high voltage cathodes like the uh, NMCs, nickel, uh, nickel cobalt manganite. So what research is next? Um, again, we are transitioning to additional electrolytes, really looking to kind of maximize how we incorporate uh, the performance with the um, energy density and again, the, the manufacturing costs. So really what I wanted to talk about here was kind of, these are the performance metrics. And for us, this goal, uh, the goal of this program is sort of threefold. One, it's performance. The next is how do we manufacture? And the third is the recycle. So in this sense, we've sort of talked about what the performance is. And now we get into the point of how do we understand the manufacturability of, of this work? Um, and again, this is just additional uh, supplementary material about some of the um, polymer and polymerization processes that, you know, just using different polymers, we can get higher conductivity, higher uh, mechanical properties, as well as more uh, scalable towards the manufacturing. Um, and, and this is similar, different uh, mesoporous uh, separators will allow for smaller, uh, smaller batteries, smaller um, cells, as well as a higher performance because of the uh, decorating of the uh, LAGP or other uh, electrolytes within these separators. Um, and again, we, as, as I mentioned, some of the uh, novel electrolytes that we're looking at. And again, the goal here is driving towards how do we take this towards uh, manufacturing and scalability. So from that, now we've talked about the performance. From that, we're going to shift into understanding the manufacturing models and the recycling models. And one of the tasks that um, that Paula and her team went through was how do we take and kind of work from an end an end result? How do we take a 15% cost reduction due to recycling? And what impact is that going to have uh, from the front end in terms of materials? how they can be sourced, how they can be used, and the uh, assembly process. So essentially these were um, the implementation here, these custom components were created uh, producing these parametric models. Um, these are all sort of a drag and drop components so we can understand what the uh, materials are, uh, what the process flows are, uh, what the impact of each process, whether it's in the slurry mixing, coating, dry solvent, slitting, stacking, welding, and closing. I mean, these are the processes needed to take a um, kind of a you know novel material that you're making in the lab towards something on a pilot scale manufacturing. And for us, I think that's critical because we need to understand well, where's the where are the the big energy hogs? What are the materials? Where are our limitations? Where are the pain points? So to be able to sort of work backwards from those perspectives to help understand what the overall perspective of the manufacturing is. And really, at the end of the day, we want to be able to, you know, go to potential sponsors, manufacturers and say, we've got these materials. Here are the performance metrics. And here's what it looks like if you were to begin manufacturing. We can help reduce costs um, by altering these components, whether it's by material or process, uh, whether it's energy or you know mass or time or, or what have you so here this is a video of um a plugin that was created and used here and this is a way for us that we build out the models the team utilizes these components to create these uh, sliders essentially which give the parametric relationships and it gives the output once it splits the output so in this case for example whether it's carbon black or a copper foil whatever those are well, if we need to scale those in terms of mass or we need to scale them in terms of cost, uh, what are the impacts that we're going to see? How do these build? And as you can see here, well, there's a new component that gets added. You drag and drop. It comes in, it adds, whether it's materials, whether it's components, whether it's uh, tasks, a uh, total cost, cost history. Really, the goal here is to create as much data as we can and help understand the data sets that we can now alter um, from a uh, fabrication standpoint to best understand what the overall impact is going to be. So the goal here is not for you guys to see specific you know, modules, uh, more of the kind of process flow of what happens. And as you can see here, some of these sliders are moving back and forth. And as those sliders are moving back and forth, 
operation costs, capital costs, time, carbon, energy, uh, specific values are, are altered. So when you look through here and you're like, okay, if we're going to take carbon black from 17% to 68%, well, okay, the overall carbon is going to go up, the time might go down, the labor costs might go up, capital goes down. So really it helps us to create the sandbox in which we're playing uh, that says, what is a realistic uh, set of parameters for us? The next was sort of taking that and um, kind of utilizing the manufacturing. And really for us, I'm sorry, for the, the, the manufacturing with the goal for the recycling. And in this case, we wanted to do the same thing and really understand what are those scenarios. So here are various scenarios that are, that are, that are, are developed that says, if we use this material, if we use less of this, more NMC, more PVDF. Uh, one of them has more of an impact on overall costs. One of them has less of an impact, but may have more cost on uh, the drain uh, for the logistics. What m some may be sourced locally, some may be sourced, um, you know, internationally. So really, for us, the goal is helping to understand kind of the overall impact here, and really trying to figure out how can we optimize this. In this case, they were doing, um, you know, single uh, single function objective, we can do multi-objective um, optimization here. And um, really for us, we, we, need to, we need to understand these perspectives. We need to see what the cost drivers are. Uh, next would be something like environmental impacts, um, helping to understand what environmental impacts. We're working with partners at UC Riverside right now as one of the largest uh, lithium deposits was just uh, discovered outside the Salton Sea in California. So uh, there's, a, there's a huge effort right now in the processing, the mining, the cleaning, uh, the development and the integration back into the supply chain locally, uh, because most of the lithium comes um, at this point comes from China. And even if it, if it doesn't, um, it goes through China oftentimes. So Argentina has a large deposit and they sell to China and then China sells. So um, their neighbor, Chile, also has a very large deposit. And uh, we're, we're working with a couple of universities there that are um, sort of housed to um, work, work with the miners there. So they've made it a real effort to not source to China. Um, so that, that, that's, those are all impactful uh, components to us as well. So with, with the modeling, um, we really do need to understand what the impact of these batteries are, the end of life. So we talked about kind of First, that was uh, material reclamation. And in this case, as Beryl mentioned, the kind of the, the, the difference between the two, whether it's in reuse or in reclamation. And in this case, um, one of the primary concerns at this point is what are we going to do with these batteries? Even before we start ripping them up and utilizing them, they need to be uh, discharged. And that's a huge problem. So we're working with uh, Cox Mobility, who manages one of the largest uh, uh, fleets you know, like rental cars and, you know, they're international. They have, you know, tens and tens of thousands of vehicles. And with the electrification, they need to understand what are they going to do with that? They've got warehouses full of batteries that they don't know what to do with. And they're not ready to be recycled yet because it's dangerous. So currently they've got, you know, a group of engineers, you know, some sort of low level employees that come in and they do resistive heating, they plug it in and they kind of back up and hope things don't explode and, you know, and they're like, well, we can't go in that room right now. It's, it's too hot. There's a thousand batteries being depowered. and It's just a mess. Um, but they're not alone in it because we've never really gotten to this point where we have an infrastructure need in place to be able to handle that. So that's what we're working towards doing. Understanding first steps of what these ohmic or DC electronic load discharge looks like, whether it's um, these aqueous solutions where you can use these you know, salt baths to sort of remove the chemical energy. Um, but there are challenges for all of those as well. So really understanding um, that end of life and that whole process has initial steps. Once we remove them, then we have to depower them. Once you depower them, you have to separate them. Once you separate them, then you have to reclaim them. Once they're reclaimed, then they have to be reused. What has value? What doesn't? Um, so it, it's, a, it's a large task. And it, it's something um, that I believe the sort of system level modeling that we look at is um, very adept at handling because it has these um, uh, multi-objective optimizations where we can look at it and say whether it's cost or reuse or what what whatnot. And yeah, and again, um, the analytics for the battery um, before and after we need to understand you know when they're ready to be discharged um, and what they look like. 
what those discharges uh, profiles look like in terms of time. Again, that's another big driver is cost. Sometimes it'll take them, you know, 16, 18 hours of, of time to be able to sort of slowly drain these batteries away. And then after that, then try to figure out what to do with it. So um, yeah, more, more of these uh, dissolution mechanisms. Um, <clears throat> again, I don't wanna get to in the details about the specific processes, but just to understand that there are a number of processes and each of these processes have their own limitations and their own benefits. And for us trying to figure out you know, which one, and again, there's no magic bullet. So each process may be more effective for a specific application and understanding how we um, best tie those together is critical. So as we've seen, you know, we do know that the state of Georgia is becoming a huge epicenter for battery recycling uh, and the volume of energy storage modules is getting there and we do need a robust industry and we are not there yet. Um, and the need for those that are looking, it, it, it's, it's still a few years in the future, right? We're still at a small percentage of electric vehicles and electric vehicle batteries on the market, um, but there's, it's scaling and it's growing. And it's projected that by 2030 uh, and 2035, some states could be up to a 50% of electric vehicles. So then you take sort of the five-year point after that, 10-year point after that, well, what are we doing with these batteries now? So now's the time to really be looking into this because in that 10 to 15 year period, um, we need basically to rebuild and rework the infrastructure to be able to do that. And again, all of this is done with uh, cost optimization because we need to understand once recycled, what are these scalability and the raw materials at different volumes, what does it look like? Um, so we do some modeling, we do some cost modeling, uh, we scale them by production, uh, we help understand, um, you know, with some of our industry partners, you know, batch size and process. And as we scale them, what those impacts look like. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, as you optimize towards cost, but you have the opportunity with your model to optimize towards different subject matters. Longevity could have been one. Yep. Uh, or minimization of material sourcing could mm -hmm. have been one. I mean, yep. there are different other options. Have you iterated that also through the model or is it by default? Because I know that's of course our typical yeah. view and, and you could say it's a linear view of the economy. Typically something de uh, depreciates value, yep. but you could argue that in particular in a circular economy, we look at this from a different vantage point or Definitely. maybe from a multiplicity of vantage points. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I, that's a great point. And I think kind of the, archaic view of sort of the linear depreciation models are, are, are really no longer um, applicable, just like you said, really helping to understand what those cost curves look like. In this case, we started with cost curves. Um, you know, the, we spent the first six to eight months sort of gathering data, building out these models, and then the next couple of months sort of optimizing the specific one. But now that we have a lot of these models in place, kind of the creation of these meta models um, are critical. And, you know, cost was one that it's easy to see, uh, it's easy to see for sponsors. It's easy to see, but when we get into longevity, I mean, they they're not they're they're interdependent. So the cost models are going to be based on what those longevity are and where they're sourced from. So those are things that we are definitely going to optimize and uh, model towards in the future. As well. Elon, can I ask something along those same lines? Sure. Um, so here in this model, the Raw materials process synthesis, I think, assumes that you're procuring primary materials, right? It's not recycled. Um, that's a good that's a good point. I, I would say um, in this in this block diagram that that's probably the case. But in, in a sense, it also could be raw material from from recycled. But I think for the most part, generally speaking, that that is the case. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if there is any um, cost curve forecasting that one can do that based on what you're picking as materials, if these batteries will end up being one of the primary sources, are there some that are easier to reclaim and therefore the cost curve would look different um, when you take into or maybe more favorable when you look at end of life economics at the same time as, as absolutely 
Absolutely. That, that, that's a great point. Um, and I think, you know, we had just begun building up these recycling models. And I think um, utilizing the models that we created there to provide input into uh, the scaling, I think, is, is going to be critical. Uh, because, again, that is going to be a primary driver for the overall cost and lifetime. You know, where the usage is, what's worth trying to reclaim um, versus others, and what is most likely to be uh, you know, pump back into specific supply chains and where those supply chains are going to be uh, optimal for. So that, that that's a that's a good point, and I think those are things that we are going to look now that we have kind of created um, these sort of skeleton models. Now we can really start diving into uh, the specifics, um, the specifics behind that. Yeah, what I is the longevity? Of, sorry, um, no, what is the ahead. longevity of of these? Um, batteries or the I think, solid um, states battery technology? Yeah, so the goal I think in the industry is at 20 years. I think uh, 10 years is kind of the safety point that says once you've received that 10 year, that 10 year point, that's kind of, um, you know, acceptable. So I think we, we don't really know yet, to be honest. You know, a lot of this is still laboratory. Uh, we haven't seen how these are cycled in the environment yet because there are no solid state batteries in vehicles at this point. Uh, we're starting to see, you know, Ford and a couple others that are just announcing that in 2024, 2025, they want to see the first solid state batteries in vehicles. But, you know, projections are very different. Um, and, you know, we see projections for 20 years, but, you know, if we're in that kind of eight to 10 year is, I, I would not be surprised. Thank you. But the, the materials themselves have, have law, have, can, can have, um, you know, larger, longer life cycles. You know, a lot of this material, um, some of it will become spent as it cycles through, but some of it will have a, a, a longer lifetime. Uh, so it will be uh, kind of reintegrate them back into specific usage. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that none of these, none of this battery technology is used in vehicles currently. Um, so current electrical electric vehicles, are they using lithium ion batteries? Yep. And what is the comparison of lifetime for that kind of yeah. battery technology? They're all uh, lithium ion, your traditional battery, you know, when you get a lipo battery in your phone or whatever, the Tesla, the power walls, they all are manufactured by a Panasonic or an SK, a very few large scale manufacturers, and then they aggregate them together into a close pack to kind of increase the overall um, capacity, but they are all uh, your traditional lithium polymer batter, or I would say all, but 90 to 95 percent, the overwhelming majority are all your traditional lithium ion batteries. And um, the life cycle, the, 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 the projected life of solid state is significantly higher because of some of the reasons we talked about earlier, the cyclability, the outgassing, um, and the, uh, the, the potential for oxidation. And then you know, in, um, in impact. So some of the uh, impact studies have shown um, that the, the degradation will be dramatic in, um, in, in the lithium polymer versus the solid state. So, you know, oftentimes uh, electric vehicles now are scrapped if they were in a, an accident and the battery was damaged. And it's like a third of the cost of the entire vehicle is the battery itself. So you can kind of scale that and sort of repurpose some of those uh, materials it's going to you know um, increase the overall life cycle there too i know you had and if it's gonna, mm -hmm. i have already got a little comments but are you able to iterate this like cause and effect techno economic analysis to apply it to like socioeconomic terms so like you talked about the context yeah. on materials i'm wondering like it's great that we're moving away from that but i'm wondering what that will do to that community and then also yeah. on the other end that, that's a great point um i would say at this point it's probably outside of our scope However, there are um, there are a number of things that um, it's 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 very important. There's no question about that. And um, we're actually kind of working on another project where we're developing these what's called ESG scoring. And the ESG scoring it's, it's in 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 architecture is similar to like a lead, you know, the way they're scored. However, it does incorporate uh, external factors and environmental factors like that. So I think that's actually a great opportunity to sort of uh, merge the two together because helping to understand uh, the socioeconomic impact um, is a real challenge. 
And another thing that we had worked on in the past when we were working on this uh, reinvent the toilet challenge, I don't know if you guys have heard about that. There's a Gates funded project to uh, bring sanitation to the developing world. Um, that was a huge, huge platform for that as well, because you could create these systems, but if you don't get buy-in from, um, you know, a, a, a village in you know rural India or in China where these are going to be used, and if you're not, um, you know, equipping it, equipping with its, um, with their standard technology and the protocols that are are generally utilized, then it's not going to be accepted. Um, so understanding the economic benefits and how that merges with the sort of sociological is 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 critical okay. yeah. yeah um can you characterize some of the what what you what is considered a solid state electrolyte obviously liquid electrolyte is obvious but um, um mm -hmm. i've also seen where um electrolytes i think here at georgia tech are being developed that are more like a gel yep or like a like that adhesive mm -hmm. sticky stuff that you get in that's right like mailers yeah like I would, they, those are still going to be referred to as as solid like we do some of those and we we collaborate with uh, some other folks here at campus in the mechanical engineering and material science uh, developing these kind of like rubber like um, you know flexible polymers and the key is just the liquid electrolytes um, but also the material behind it which oxidize you know, quickly and has that thermal runaway issues. So these polymers, these gel polymers, um, they do provide the kind of structural integrity and still give that interfacial contact that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah, maybe a few comments. Um, so I have been somewhat involved with this a few over the past. Um, so I'm an architect, so but I have been working for Deso Systems. It's a firm that works with the auto industry uh, closely on uh, material and um, also battery alliances. Mm -hmm. um, and so probably would be interesting maybe for you to look at Europe, uh, particularly the auto industry there had a kind of eye opening moment because of COVID and the crisis, a total faltering of the supply chain, or we could also call it network. Um, and particularly also focus on you know the crisis um, and how you would be independent eventually again from a material point of view because Europe has not not at all the vastness of resources and so there was this uh, shocking awakening <laughs> that actually the entire car industry which you know is a huge component in Germany um, you know would fall flat essentially without that support of material so there the strategy is slightly different than I think just going on one particular material model they actually, um, because there's also this whole take back already very established with BMW, for example, completely recycles back. The car is thought of being completely a, a part of the circular economy already. Mm -hmm. And so what they do with the batteries, essentially, they like that, you know, you do it here with uh, or we did it with cassettes, you know, they're different formats. And so essentially what they have, they have different uh, material mixtures that is the battery of a BMW is slightly different in a composition mm -hmm. than it would be the battery of the Volkswagen, for example. So, and with that, they kind of um, almost force further that recycling. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you do not have it all anymore, the waste, but literally you take back the batteries that you put out in the market. And it's actually the vendor's responsibility. So it's more like a Tesla also, it's almost a product that you bring as a service right. onto the market right. instead of that the ownership is, and therefore also this whole recyclability problem is shifted off, you know? So usually you have the product in a moment of sales, the, the responsibility is with the owner. Now, in this model, of course, the responsibility, and I think this is an interesting shift away from the ownership question in terms of these assets mm -hmm. towards a service model, which, you know, you could say, what is the Tesla's real model is a data collection model right. versus a provision of a car. Right. Now, and then the battery, of course, because of charging and the need to be charging it is one of the key ports of interface to understand where are you, yep. where do you charge? Yep. And with that, you start sooner than later tap into the entirety of the house and the data escape of the house, right? So I just wanna make sure that, so when you see that, I think there are already incredible facets emerging in terms of business models, but also in terms of the complexities of what we're looking at. Um, so, and maybe another, comp so therefore, I think this whole, the question about the social and um, how it ties back into the world economy, in fact, is I think, through 
the shock of COVID moving towards a much more what they call it material autonomous model, where um, wouldn't say it is more nationalistic, but it definitely looks into the larger scopes of economies where they hope the circular economy will support them to get a little bit more away from that you know, dependency they see. At least yeah. in Europe, that's the case. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious if the manufacturers here, because it's a very strong startup culture here, and how far they see that also via the battery, you know, as being yeah. one of the, you know, the key components of taking back and maybe moving towards a service model uh, for the car industry per se, you know, so just as a comment. I, I think that's a great, it's a great question and a great point. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the manufacturers that are now coming here and leading the charge in electric vehicles have come from Europe. So my guess is that if they had seen the success there, they're going to adopt those. You know whether it's Volkswagen, BMW. Um, so I, I think those are the ones that are kind of currently, uh, you know, ahead of the game here, and probably for using models like that. Yes, and they use, frankly, they use the simulation software mm -hmm. in order to simulate the entire car performance. But they're also now going into the simulation of the battery performance. Yep. And then even including on the microscopic level of how the assemblage is, how the packaging is yep. done, and how because that is another model question I have for your model. Um, there's a, a tremendous output right now in terms of, I think, 20% of the manufactured batteries fail. They have to be sorted out. They never make see the market. Mm -hmm. So alone that, if you look at Tesla, I think that you see these giant piles of batteries hanging out there, which are those batteries that are not suited to at all ever being arriving in the market. So I wonder in your cost modeling or even recycling modeling, recycling almost starts, there's a teeny loop maybe immediately in the manufacturing right, right. where there would be an, you know, it never leaves actually. Rejected material, what can be salvaged, what gets. Or rejected battery. So, and then I think would be the question, and how far do you optimize your manufacturing methodologies towards minimizing the out, the negative output? Um, that would be another question, I think, of profitability. Or you Taking notes, Paula? I mean, Paula, I'm happy to, you know, and I know we never talked about it because we, <laughs> she didn't know that I was <laughs> once um, upon a time invested in this topic. We are aware of the complexity and we are trying to see if there are different markets for different products because, as you said, the solid state batteries are not produced yet and we are working on that um, field. Basically, we can kind of have a parallel model with lithium batteries right now, but they don't exactly match the solid state. But we are in our model, our target is also to identify the different markets for different performances and so it's it's open, it's very complex, it's not complete at the moment, but yeah, great moment. I mean, I think it's a question of how detailed you're modeling, you know, how, how, how much detail you put into the right. model, because, yeah. um, you know, each of these boxes can be fully obsessed and right. it's a system of system of systems, exactly. right? And uh, the same, by the way, if you want to map the um, life cycle, as in the, the material assessment, the material passports or anything, that will get into the same amount of complexity. Mm -hmm. If you really want to determine it to the point, um, there's a, and again, Paula, we can discuss it. There's a whole mapping and tracking of it. So the industry is creating right now these material passports, you're probably well aware of. And, and those go in absolute minutiae into mm. the details of where the material is from. Exactly. Exactly. Processes, all that. And then if you compare that to the aerospace defense industry, where you look at the feedback loops between the model and the actual material fabrication, they have a very super tight um, feedback loop between what the simulation assumes and when, what de facto is happening in the factory. So they need to match this up by law that the simulation and the model projection is not too far away from the actual executioner. Because if you have a different material batch, it may have a complete different performance right. Right. or if whatever changes in the system. So I just, it's a super interesting um, topic and it, the, only the manufacturing box alone is absolutely deep. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's, uh, that is absolutely true. The great topic you have. Yeah, and, and, this and of was, course, this in was, the U.S., there's absolutely not the same circular economy legislative environment that there is in Europe. <laughs> that's right. And, so, I, and I think, that, you know, these are the types of programs and platforms that a you problem. Know, hopefully develop and, you know, help help fix that, help change that. Yeah, so I think it's a question how much can you import also learn, right? I mean, you don't need to reinvent the wheel necessary, but maybe um, you can, I mean, I would say team up with some 
of the modeling. I can put you together, Paula, with somebody who does this modeling um, that I've seen. I mean, again, this is from an industry perspective, right? This is a mm -hmm. professional, super large software house that does yeah. that. Yeah. And again, I'm not sure that needs to be, you know, to be seen, but at least you could maybe talk to them and see what they already have modeled yeah. and how they go over it. Um, because they do that, as far as I know, with the large in, um, automotive industry. Yeah, a lot of that is open source material that ideally we would be able to take and kind of plug it. Obviously, some of it is proprietary, Georgia, but there's plenty of kind of manufacturing open source. And a lot of these materials are just sourced, whether it's, um, you know, kind of the solar panel industry or, or in batteries as well, mm -hmm. kind of understanding, you know, where do you get? Because most of the material is sort of commonality, right, whether it's in stainless or aluminum uh, some of the spacers, even though even kind of some of the other the lithium, nickel, manganese, things like that um, has other usage. So you know it's sort of a well-defined uh, kind of set of protocols for that. So I think for us, as you said, for us to be able to kind of tap into that and then optimize our performance and our manufacturing based on you know what some of those processes look yeah. like. Mm -hmm. um, the battery alliance. Take a look. So this is a formation of key users and manufacturers mm. and there's another whole economy emerging the car manufacturers become themselves as tesla does as well becoming the battery manufacturers that's right which also is interesting and that's particular to make themselves independent of the battery exactly. producers again yeah ford's doing that now yeah. uh, rivian yeah. is doing yeah, that rivian. i have a bit of a facetious question okay whatever happened to graphene that was going to save the world yeah well it's a good point and you know i i spent years and years and still do work with graphene and graphene um graphene does have a role um so for example most batteries right now the electrodes are graphite um so the goal was well we could make graphene batteries um which have you know 200 times the unit strength of steel and are more conducting than copper uh, the problem is to grow this sort of pristine monolayer graphene, it's in processes called chemical vapor deposition. It takes hours and hours to grow these individual monolayers, which are, you know, five inks from steak, right? One tenth of a nanometer or so, four tenths of a nanometer. So then to be able to kind of do them, and stay, it, it just never became cost competitive because of the processing. The next step, there's kind of another classification. You have the pristine graphene and you have what's called RGO, which is reduced graphene oxide. And that's basically like graphite. Uh, we're working with a company right now that uh, produces uh, graphene or graphitic nanofibers from uh, landfill gases. So there's another sort of in the circular economy. It produces, you know, you can take piped methane or a landfill gas, and we have this catalytic process that separates it and produces clean hydrogen. And the byproduct is, is a carbonaceous material. You can use... Um, some thermal processing and kind of reduce uh, the oxygen vacancies and remove those and you're left with what's called RGO, reduced graphene oxide. And you can make like nanofibers, nanotubes, things like that. And um, and there is absolutely still a role in, in, um, in batteries. Um, I think graphene's sweet spot right now is in the medical devices and microelectronics because um, I feel like what happened was you've got the kind of high performing, high performing pristine graphene, and then you've got kind of the bulk graphene or all the rest. And the performance increase of this sort of other is not high enough to validate and warrant all the additional processing steps. Whereas this one, the, 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 the performance is so high, but the cost is so high that we never really found that kind of happy medium for all the different applications. And that's what the goal was originally, right? It was this wonder material that was going to be used everywhere. Now, you know, we use it in paints and concretes and coating. The decarbonization, you can remove, you know, 12 to 15 percent of, of the bulk concrete by a 1 to 2 percent additive of graphene because of its flexure, flexure and Young's modulus and strength. So there is absolutely still a market for graphene. We are still working with it. Uh, we utilize it. Uh, we make um, batteries. We make electrodes with graphene um, and potentially in solid state as well, although we're already now looking down the line for anode free uh, batteries, which is where the graphene would be. Um, but again, there is no magic bullet and there are going to be different batteries and different chemistries for all different applications. So things like low cyclability, uh, high C rate batteries, uh, graphene is a good is a, is a good interaction. And uh, those can be used for more static devices, more static systems like 
a solar farm or data centers where you don't need the kind of high performing batteries, but you can have these flow batteries, things like that. Um, you have the opportunity for graphene integration there. Well, this was uh, this is all I have. So, what about power walls? Yeah, so power walls again, as we, as I said, they're just an individual lithium ion battery that was produced by Panasonic, and then they aggregate them together into a fancy box. It's basically it's it was it was a genius marketing idea because it's basically what they do with Tesla, and they took what was a Prius or a Nissan Leaf. And they didn't really update the technology dramatically. They made the batteries a little bit better and they made them look a lot cooler and they branded them. And you know, now since then the technology has gotten better, but it's not groundbreaking um, uh, technology. I mean, these are traditional lithium polymer batteries that are aggregated together into a nice, into a nice package. So what would you think would be the energy storage of the household of the future? Well, I think solid state is the key. One, because of the energy, energy density and two, because of the safety. Because there are issues there, whether you've got a generator, whether you've got these power walls, uh, if you have a fire in the house, something like that, um, that you've got a, a you know huge risk. So I think that this is where the solid state batteries, um, because of their potential high energy density, um, they can be up to eight or 10x of the lithium polymer battery. So I think that that is where we're going to see um, you know the interaction point. When can we productize it? It's a good question. Hopefully soon. Okay. It's resource dependent, you know. I mean, as you know, time, money, or quality, right? You you, you can't sacrifice on all of them. You can kind of triangulate and with more money and more time, or if it's faster, it'll be less quality. So, you know, we um, there are companies that are starting to get them, and I think once they see the performance in vehicles, I think they'll become uh, adopted a lot quicker. How much money do you Knock need for the investment? How much do you have? I have yeah, nothing, but you know, I'm kicking uh, people. <laughs> I think, um, I think, you know, again, I think this is going to be a sort of a billion dollar industry of research. And I think for us, there are so many kind of pieces of the of the pie. And I think our our piece of the pie, what we work with um, here at Georgia Tech in kind of the, the energy storage community, there's a, you know, there's a group um, that does a lot of this. And really, I, I, the goal that we're driving towards right now is the production of a kind of a, a pilot manufacturing one. So we can validate and say, okay, this is great, we've done this, but now it's not really applicable into manufacturing. So the research kind of um, dies on the table to some extent. So I think for us, our goal is to be able to produce, and just like they did with this AI plant, the AI uh, MPF, if you guys have heard of that, over on campus, that is like a $65 million NSF award to do uh, advanced manufacturing. Uh, initially, there was like a $30 million component. It was, it was a $100 million plan that uh, had um, kind of manufacturing for solid state batteries, roll to roll. I think Tequila Harris was one of the primes on that. And Matt McDowell was the energy storage lead. The, the, the battery component it got removed. And I think now Matt and I are really kind of driving towards building out something like that. And I think you look at you know schools like uh, University of Michigan or Penn State that have these battery centers. And, I, you know, I think those are on the kind of, you know, 10 to $20 million scale in terms of overhead and cost, equipment, uh, manufacturing. And I think for us in that kind of as a, as, a, as a Georgia Tech, as a GTR, as a unit, that kind of like five to $10 million is going to get us to a point where we can now have this uh, sort of pilot manufacturing plant that, that shows compatibility, kind of takes that next step out of the lab towards manufacturing. Because... You know, we can't get past the TRL three or four, you know, with the $300,000 glove box and kind of a bunch of graduate students sort of assembling things by hand. It's great on the validation side, but as you said, sort of to, to take that and then be able to ship that to an SK or a Ford or a Panasonic and say, guys, look, not only do we have this innovative material and concepts, but we have now validated that this can be manufactured per your protocols like this. And I think that's kind of the level of investment needed to, to be able to do that. Should be fine. I mean, you should be, there seems to be, a, I mean, the car industry must back, you know, or, and then, and then, I mean, even people that need, I mean, because if, let's say, if we get rid of gas and oil for house heating, and we're all running on heat pumps, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Somehow, somewhere, Ideally, we would be able to storage the energy. 
because yeah. if we all consume at peak moments, the whole collapse of the the energy system will occur. That's right. Um, and we need also, in, if, let's go, go solar, but solar is not always on. So we need for some nights storage. That's and right. ideally you want to take the peaks away, right? Yes. Store when cheap or when available. Yep. It's called the, the duck belly curve. Exactly. As it yeah. kind of moves and for so, us. And that's why I say that storage is the bottleneck to unlock all of the renewables. Yeah. And exactly. at some point you've got these competing entities um, and I think that's where we are in this position at Georgia Tech and at GTRI to become this kind of uh, nucleation point for all of the industries to come in and say a million dollars from a board, half a million dollars, three million dollars from an SK to kind of build out like the, the Marcus Queen Room and to have this shared space that comes in and says, OK, we're going to now uh, innovate and we're going to have these opportunities that are coming in from these spaces. Um, and I think that's kind of that's kind of our goal right now is to, to is to get input and resources from the automotive and, and other industries to help with that. Yeah. Each of those little boxes in your optimization model, though, presumptively, you know how those processes work, right? And some better than others. Well, how do you get around the issue? And, and you mentioned sort of open source information. How do you get around? I mean, when there's proprietary, yeah, and I imagine there's a lot of people that don't want you to know how that's they right. get, and, and that's a challenge. The output that they want that has been a huge challenge for us. I mean, the, you know, the models and something that Paul always tells me that I'm asking, she's like, the models are only good as the data that you can put into it. Yeah. So the more that we find, the more accurate the models are, and you know, some of those are empty boxes because we don't have information. Some of them are more detailed because we have more. Um, and I think the, the more the industry grows, uh, the more opportunities there are, the more uh, data points there are, and the more um, the more accurate and kind of convergence we can get on, on our models. But that, that that's a huge limiting factor right now. Yeah. Accessibility. Elon, on, on, on this, you know, Georgia Tech's competitive edge and what investments are needed, um, I presume this battery technology idea is part of the... Um, um, NSF Regional Innovation Engine yeah, grant yeah, that was, went in. That's like what I was just mentioning. So there was 160 actually, million one. Yeah. So the section of battery was actually removed and did not get funded. So the six it was ended. It was a hundred million dollar proposal that ended up getting funded at 65 million dollars, I believe. And most of that is for uh, the AI and manufacturing. No, no, no. That's not the one. That's the one you're talking about. The one that did get funded, but then right. there is the NSF type two award that just got submitted on January 15, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was on yeah. EVs. I presume battery is big in there. It, it is, yeah. So uh, Rich Simmons and, and Tim Lewin and Matt uh, sort of led that charge, sort of uh, incorporating a big component of that, which would have some, um, yeah, some capital resources for for this. Yeah. Well, we are thank reaching you. four o'clock and uh, we're starting to lose some people. So let's thank Elon. Uh, thank you, thank you very back. much, Elon. Yeah, appreciate I'll you, you guys, all back you. again in two weeks for uh, another presentation. And Phil Bozeman, the speaker, um, I'm civil and environmental engineer. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank Thanks you all. Everybody. Online as thank well. you guys. Thank yeah. you for joining. Thank Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.